Hey guys and gals, how's it going? I hope you had have have had there we go a good week, and we are ready to get on some more armor. Right, we need to put on some more armor. We've put on three pieces. We've got three more pieces of armor that we're gonna deal with. So, we've already got on our belt of truth because we got to put that on first. And unless we know God's word, unless we know the truth, then we don't know what to do. So we got to put on that truth first. And where do we find that truth? We find that truth right here in the Bible, in God's word. Only place we're going to find it. So we put on that belt of truth. We learn that truth. We learn what God's word says about how he wants us to behave and what he wants us to do. And then we slap on that breastplate of righteousness, right? And what did we decide righteousness was? Righteousness is right living. It's living in accordance with what God has laid out in his word in the Bible. So we've got on that truth. We know the truth. We're living by the truth. And then we have on our shoes of the gospel of peace. Because once we know God's word and once we're living God's word, we can have peace in our life no matter what is going on, right? Even through a year like last year, it's a new year now. Yay, happy new year. It's 2021 and 2020 was a tough year. We talked about that. A lot of people went through a lot of things last year. But those of us that know God and have Jesus as our savior, we can have peace even through all of the ter turmoil of last year, which is a true blessing that God has given us. Oh, we're so glad he gave us this armor, aren't we? All right, so you guys ready to learn about the next thing that we're going to pick up? I hope so. All right, so let's head to our scripture. We are in the book of Ephesians. We are in chapter 6. And this week, our piece of armor is going to come from verse 16. So grab your Bibles, open them up, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. Let's see what it says. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Mm. So this week we are going to pick up the shield of faith. All right. So let's look and see what the Roman shield looked like. Ooh, look at that. I got it. Yay. All right. So this will be kind of an example of what a Roman shield would have looked like. Now you may have been thinking it was a round one like maybe um, a superhero we all know named Captain America would carry around. But this Roman shield was a little bit different than Captain America's shield. The Roman shield was about four feet tall and between two and two and a half feet wide. Okay, And so it could obviously cover a whole soldier if he crouched down. He could hide behind that, which is pretty cool. They were made of wood, covered by leather, and then at the center, a lot of times they had some iron there to really strengthen it. And some of them even would put iron on the corners. So on the edges, they would also put some iron. But this is kind of the shield that we're referring to, that Paul was referring to when he talked about taking up the shield of faith. Now, something really interesting that the Roman soldiers would do is they would take their shield and they would get it wet before they went into battle. And there's a reason for that. We'll talk about that in just a second. All right, so this is kind of what the shield looked like. So what did the Roman soldier use his shield for? Well, obviously, we just mentioned he could crouch down and hide behind it. So it was obviously used for protection for himself right? So it was big enough to where if he was in hand-to-hand -hand combat and it was, it was big enough and heavy enough that it could defend him from a big sword being swung at him. It could also defend him if he is marching and arrows start coming at him. He could hold up his shield and it could take the brunt of the arrows, right? So he would use it for, to protect himself from those things. And he could also use this to help protect other soldiers. And I'm going to show you another picture that I think is just so cool. The, the Romans were really smart in their battle. 
This is something that the Roman soldiers could do, and it was called the turtle formation or the tortoise formation. And so if you see, they each had their own shield. And what they would do is with a lot of their shields, they had some hooks on the side that allowed them to hook them together. So if they were being attacked from arrows by, by a barrage of arrows, which just means a lot of arrows coming at them, they could all kind of group together and hook their shields together. And like the ones in the front would hold them in front of them. And then the middle ones would hold them on top. And then the ones in the back could hold them behind them and they could have some on the sides. And so they could completely cover themselves and protect themselves from that bombardment of arrows. Okay. And so what I mentioned before is a lot of times before they went into battle, they would get their shield really wet. And the reason for that was a lot of their enemies would shoot flaming arrows. So these were arrows that were on fire. And so they would wet their shield so that if an arrow hit their shield, it wouldn't catch the shield on fire. And if the arrow got into the wood deep enough, that amount of the water that was within the wood could quench that fire. It could put that fire out. So... That is pretty cool. They were pretty smart, weren't they, those Romans? I guess that's why they conquered most of the known world at that time, because they were really smart in how they went to war and battle. All right, so I'm just going to put this back on the board. All right, so that is what the Roman soldiers used their shields for. It's for their own personal protection and also so that they could join together and protect all of them so they could protect protect each other with their shield all right so we're going to now talk about what does the shield of faith do for us you know what let me i always forget this so i'm not going to forget it this time so the roman shield let's write that down um Okay, so the Roman shield, it would protect himself. A Roman soldier's shield, uh, we'll say that, okay. Would help him protect himself, and it was also help him protect other soldiers. Okay, so our shield is called the shield of faith. So let's first try to figure out what is faith. Hmm, anybody have any ideas? Hmm, well, there's a verse in the Bible that kind of tells us what faith is. So why don't we start there? Okay, it's in the book of Hebrews. So anybody remember where Hebrews is? We're in Ephesians. So it's after Ephesians. So we go Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon, Hebrews. So it's after Philemon. All right, and have we have we learned that far yet? What did we know? We, we learned to Philemon, so it's after the last book we learned last time in our New Testament song. So let's flip to Hebrews chapter 11. Okay, everybody there? All right, Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to read verses 1 and 3. Okay, so let's listen. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And verse 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Hmm, so did that answer our question, what is faith? Maybe just a little, right? It's a little confusing. Basically, what that's saying, when, when we look at verse 3, it's we know that God created the world, right? We didn't see him do it. We Nobody saw him do it, but we have faith. We believe that he did it, even though we didn't see it happen. So that's kind of, it's it's believing something that we don't necessarily see, but it's it's more than that even. So, Let's, um, let's look at an example of faith, 
okay? And we're going we're gonna to look at a couple different examples of faith to really help us understand what is faith. So I want to go back to the Old Testament and look at a group of people who I'm sure you have studied before, the children of Israel. Okay, so we're going to go all the way back to the second book of the Old Testament. Anybody know what that one is? First book is Genesis, and the second book is Exodus. Very good. All right, so we're going to go to Exodus chapter 11. All right, way back there in the Old Testament. All right, and in this part of Exodus, we have Moses, and he is performing some things, some miracles in front of Pharaoh in an attempt to get Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go because they've been in captivity there in Egypt for a while. So they've had these things called plagues, right? So I'm sure you've studied that before. There were 10 plagues. And let's see. Ooh, I didn't even think about, do I still remember all 10 plagues? Let's see. Water into blood, frogs, lice, flies, death of the cattle, hail, boil, locusts, darkness, and then the 10th plague, which is the one we're going to read about right now. Okay, so look at that. I remember. Wow, if you don't know those, you should probably learn those. It's just nice to be able to, to remember all 10 of those. I think I even got them in the right order, but you probably should check that and make sure and let me know if I got something out of order there. Okay, so we are in Exodus chapter 11, and we're going to read verses 4 through 7. Okay, so Exodus chapter 11, verses 4 through 7. So this is Moses speaking now. Then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, about midnight, I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals. Then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such was not like it before, nor shall be like again. But... Against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue against man or beast, that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. So here is Moses letting the people know God has decided this is the tenth plague. They've already had the other nine. This is it. And what's going to happen is all the firstborn are going to die. So we're going to pop into chapter 12 now. And we're going to read verses 5 through 7 because now Moses is going to give the children of Israel some instructions. So let's go to chapter 12, verses 5 through 7. And he's told them they have to get a lamb. And it says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. And I'm going to flip down to verse 13. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, and this would be God speaking to Moses saying, when I, I is God there, to see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. All right. So this is the instruction. So Moses told them, this is what's going to happen. And then he says, this is what you need to do to make sure that when this happens, that you are not affected by this. So you've got to put this blood from this one-year-old male lamb that you've taken and killed on the 14th day of the month. And then you're going to take the blood and you're going to put it all around the door. So at the top of the door and the sides of the door, they're going to smear some of this blood and then when the angel of God comes around when it sees the blood it will know Israelites live there and to pass over and the firstborn in that house will not die so the children of Israel by faith they had to take action didn't they he told them God will protect you God will save you but you have to do this you and so if they did that then the angel of death would pass over them and they did, and the angel of death did pass over them, those who followed God's command. 
And so from there, we kind of see that faith is, they had to believe first that God was going to do this. And you would hope after the previous nine plagues that they would believe that, yeah, God said he's going to do this, and he did it, and we've seen it nine times now. So now it's the tenth time. So first they had to believe, then they had to act on that belief, right? They actually had to do something to show that they believed in God. So they, that's how they showed their faith, is by acting on what God told them to do. So I think faith is based on what you do in response to what you believe. Okay, so faith does require something. It's not, you can't, you don't just say, oh, I have faith in God. Okay, it's all good now, right? No, you still have to do things. So let's look at a verse in the New Testament in the book of James. So we had just read in Hebrews, right, before this, Hebrews 11. So we are going to go to James. So James is right after the book of Hebrews. So let's flip on over there. Okay, get back there. All right. Hebrews, James. And the book of James was written by James. And most people believe that it was probably James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote this book, the book of James. So we are in James chapter 2. We're going to read verse 20. So chapter 2, verse 20. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? So... It, basically what that's saying is you, you don't just have faith. You have to have faith and works. You have to do something that shows your faith. So faith is really, I've got an itchy eye tonight. All right. Faith is actually adapting your behavior and your decisions and everything that you do in your life so that it lines up with what God has said and laid out in scripture in his word. So it's acting on the truth of God's word, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, and whether or not you can see any kind of evidence that everything will work out in the end, right? That's what faith is. Faith is based on God's, the truth of God's word, not on our own feelings or anything. And so you see why that very first piece of armor that we put on is so very, very important because that belt of truth is where we learn the truth. And then we can act on the truth and we can show our faith in our actions once we know that truth. So that's why truth is so very, 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 very key and core and important. And the first thing, that first piece of armor that we've got to put on. All right, so our faith is always, always, always going to be connected with how we view God. So if we view God as the true creator of the world and our savior and the one who is always there for us and has provided us with everything that we absolutely need, then our faith will reflect that. Our actions will reflect that, right? And if we don't believe and don't view God in the way that we should, then that's going to affect our faith and our actions, okay? So let's take a look at another example of someone who exhibited some faith, all right? And we're going to go to the New Testament this time. We're going to go back to the book of Luke. So remember that one, Matthew, Mark, Luke. That's the third book of the New Testament. All right, and we are going to go to chapter 5. So Luke chapter 5. I'm giving you a chance to catch up. Oh. One page at a time, right? Oh, all right, Luke chapter 5. I think I'm finally there, aren't I? Oh, nope, got to go back one more page because five's at the bottom of the previous page. All right, we are going to read verses 1 through 11 of Luke chapter 5. And I'm sure you've heard this story too before, but we're going to talk about it when we're finished reading, so let's read this together. So it was, as the multitude pressed in about him to hear the word of God, and the he we're talking about here is Jesus. So they heard that Jesus was there, and so the people have come and gathered. So he stood by the lake of Genesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, 
launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, uh, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they come and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. So these were the first apostles that Jesus called. So we've got Simon, whose name is also Peter. So Simon Peter. Sometimes you'll see his name as Simon, but most of the time it's Peter. Okay, so, so Peter and who was with him? James and John, they were all with him, and they were they were fishing. So here we have Peter, okay? He is an experienced fisherman. This is what he did for a living. So usually people who do, are doing something that they've been doing for years and years, they kind of know how to do it, right? They know, he know, knew when was the best time to catch fish, how far out to go to catch the fish, um, and then when he came back in, he knew that there weren't any fish at that point in time. They washed all their nets. So they, are, they had already cleaned everything up. They'd already gone out, done their thing, didn't find any fish that night, that day, came back in, cleaned everything up, put the boats away. And now here comes Jesus. And he gets in one of the boats and he has Simon take him out a little. He teaches. And then he says, let's go fish. Well, Peter could very easily have said, um... We've already been out there. We didn't catch anything. We're not going out again because this is not the time you catch fish. This is not when the fish are out there. I'm a fisherman. I know, right? He didn't say that, right? What does it say he said? Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down my net. So that was Peter having faith in Jesus. Even when common sense told him, this doesn't make any sense. This is not when you're supposed to catch fish. We just got back and there were no fish. So this is kind of silly. Um, but he didn't, did he? He said, we've done this, but nevertheless, I will let down my nets at your word. You've said, you've told me to do it. I'm going to go do it. Even though he may not have thought it was the best decision to make. And then what happens because of his faith? They fill two boats with fish and are nearly sinking, right? Because they catch so many fish. So there's another example of someone showing and showing us, giving us an example of what it means to have faith. Faith is not just believing, it's an action. It's taking action on that belief that you have. And we could flip back to the book of Hebrews, which we've been to already twice today, right? And Hebrews chapter 11, where we started talking about faith, where we read the first scripture, that is oftentimes referred to as the faith chapter, because it goes on to talk about the faith of a lot of different characters, people, I guess I should call them people that you read about, read about in the Bible. People like Abraham, and Sarah, and Moses, and Joshua, and a lot of the prophets in the Old Testament. And then we can read about uh, the apostles and the faith that they have throughout the New Testament. So that is what faith is. So I hope that that has given you an understanding of what faith is. Faith has to be based on the truth. Faith is adapting our behavior, our attitudes, everything that we do, and getting it all in line with God's word. And it's acting it's what we do in response to what we believe. So it's whatever actions we take, whatever thoughts we have, whatever things we say, anything that we do in based on our belief in God. So 
that hopefully hopefully that helped you understand what what faith is. So now that we kind of have that figured out, let's see. So how are we going to use the shield of faith that we have now? Because now we've got our belt, our breastplate, and our shoes on. And he tells us now, take up the shield of faith. And why do we need that shield of faith? Let's go back and read because Satan is going to be sending fiery darts at us, right? It's what it says, the fiery darts of the wicked one. We need protection, right? So let's write down the shield of faith up here. Okay, so the shield of our shield of faith is going to protect us from the fiery darts of Satan, right? Okay, so and we've talked about this a lot, right? Uh, how Satan is out there and. He's just trying to get us any way he can. And I would say that I think his biggest goal is to distract us from following God, to get us to think about other things, do, do other things that don't have anything to do with God's work, right? And one way that he can distract us is by filling our minds with doubt, right? We, we can doubt whether God is who he says he is, or whether God will do what he says he's going to do. And um, we talked about this a few weeks ago in the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis. The very first book, he put doubt in Eve's mind in the garden, right? When he asked her, are you allowed to eat of anything? What you know?" And she told him, we can eat of anything except this one tree. And God says, this will happen if we eat it. And Satan said, oh, did he really say that? And he caused Eve to have doubt about what God had said. And that's what he's going to try to get us. He's going to try to get us to doubt ourselves and doubt God. So we can have doubts about, well, does, does God really love us? Hmm. Well, let's see. Does God's word answer that for us? Let's see. I think it does. Let's look in the book of Romans. All right, so that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. All right, in the book of Romans, chapter 5. Oh, sorry, Romans 5, verse 8. Let's read that and see. Does God really love us? But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I would say yes. I don't think there's any doubt in the world that God loves us, right? He loves each and every one of us so much that he sent his only son to come and die on the cross so that we can have forgiveness of our sins and salvation and be able to live with him one day in heaven forever and ever. So yes, God does love us. Okay, so what else did Satan might say? Well, will he really forgive us? He may love us, but will he re really forgive us? Because, you know, maybe we've done something that we think is just so horrible. Well, let's look at another scripture. Let's look at 1 John. Now, 1 John is almost at the end of the New Testament because you've got 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, then Jude, then Revelation, and then you're done. So, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Okay, so 1 John 1, 9. My pages are sticking together. There we go. All right. And this verse says, If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, will he forgive us? Yes, he will. No matter what Satan tries to make us believe, God loves us. God will forgive us anything as long as we confess it and we go to him and we ask him to forgive us. All right? Well, let's talk about another way Satan might get us to doubt. Maybe he makes us doubt that God will be with us because, like we talked about, last year was a pretty rough year for some people. And so, and it may not have even been last year's pandemic or different things, but sometimes tough things happen. Maybe you get a, 
a bad grade on the test maybe that you forgot maybe you forgot to study or you studied really hard and you just you just don't know where those questions came from because you don't remember that getting covered in the in the lectures by your teacher or in the reading that you had to do um, maybe uh, someone who was your friend has decided they don't want to be your friend anymore they were mean to you they said something not nice it could be anything maybe a grandparent is sick or died and that's always sad because we just love our grandparents so much or maybe maybe our mom or dad lost their job or they're not able to work for or they're sick or something just anything and we wonder well these bad things happen is God still with us will he still be with us yes God will always be with us and let's look at a verse for that too and this is gonna be in the book of James so at right after Hebrews, I think we've been to James. Didn't we go to James earlier? I don't remember. James chapter 4, verse 8. Okay, let's see what that says. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Ah, so as long as we reach out to God, he will always, always be there for us. No matter what little fiery dart Satan tries to hit us with, we know that God loves us, God will forgive us anything, God will always be with us, and we don't need to fear, because that's another way that Satan tries to get us, is put doubt and then make us fear. So I hope that helps you understand how we can use that shield of faith to protect ourselves, right? Just knowing that God is with us and don't allow Satan to fill our mind with those doubts and those fears. So how else can we use our shield of faith? Kind of in the same way that the Romans did. Okay. We can also use it to encourage and strengthen others in their faith. Okay. There we go. That one took a long time to write, didn't it? Okay. So when, when other people see us walking in faith and picking up that shield of faith and using it to repel all those fiery darts from the, from the devil, then that's an encouragement to them. And that helps them to build up their own faith, right? And we want that because when we have people, other people around us that have built up their faith, then when we need to be built up, they're there to build us up. So we have our faith for when others need to be built up, and then they've got their faith for when we need to be built up. So it, it just helps so much, just like the uh, turtle formation, right? We are all stronger together, okay? So I think that about covers the shield of faith. I think that, right? They used it for protection and to build up others. And we can do the same thing for protection and to help encourage others to grow in their faith. So I hope that all made sense. I know faith is one of those things that's kind of hard sometimes to wrap your head around, but hopefully we covered that. But if you ever have, if you have questions or something doesn't make sense, always feel free to send me a text, an email, call me, whatever. All the information's in the directory online. Your parents can show you how to get there if you need it. All right. Okay. Good job. So now we're just going to finish off with singing our New Testament song. I think we have to add four books tonight, and then we'll be 22 out of 27, so we'll be almost there. So let's go ahead and sing up to what we learned last time, which was we learned all the way through Philemon. So let's sing through Philemon and see how well you guys are doing with it, okay? I'm going to get a little sip of water before I start to sing. Okay. You ready? Okay. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts and the letter to the Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, 
Titus and Philemon. Good job. So now let's add four more. Are you ready? Hebrews and the book of James, first and second Peter. There we go. So that's all that we have so far. Good job, those of you that are learning that and memorizing that. That is so awesome. So that when we're going through our lessons and I'm throwing scriptures out there, you know exactly where to go to find those scriptures so you can read along and follow along. All right. I think that is it. Next week we're going to add the – well, we'll next week we'll do two things. Obviously we'll do our lesson. And so we will be – what comes after the – what did we do today? We did <laughs> shield of faith. What comes after the shield? You guys remember? Belt, breastplate, shoes, and shield. Helmet. That's right. Helmet is next week. So we'll do the helmet of salvation next week. And then we will add the last five books of the New Testament. And by the following week, then, we should have that all learned, all 27 books of the New Testament. So that will be exciting. All right. You guys have a great, great, great week, and I will see you next week. Bye. Bye.